नमो बुद्धाय वेलकम एवरीबॉडी टुनाइट एज वी स्टार्ट डिस्कवरिंग अ फ्यू थिंग्स लर्निंग अ फ्यू थिंग्स अबाउट द बुद्धस टीचिंग स्क्रैचिंग एट द एट फोल पाथ लिटल बाय लिटल understanding what kind of meditation the buddha taught yesterday was a little bit about the samadhi that the buddha taught through letting go and uplifting the mind what is what i call natural samadhi what he called dhamma samadhi the collectedness that happens through dhamma with the virtue and discernment right effort <clears throat> and we saw also uh how to enter the first two levels of meditation quite well explained in that sutta tonight is not so different but is a bit of a um, longer exposition about around the same topics so tonight tonight is about this general um theme of the buddha's teaching which is bhavana wholesome mental development and we started uh looking at that a little bit yesterday we had an introduction and today is a more thorough Uh, sutta which has um the four first jhanas explained in it and i um believe it's a good sutta uh to transition towards uh the explanation of the longer the whole path where the eight or the nine jhanas as they are called sometimes are explained which we will see probably day 4 and slowly prepare us and slowly um like the buddha said to straighten our view to understand what it is that the buddha taught really and to understand the nature of states the nature of unwholesome states and the nature of wholesome states and why we let go of the first and we cultivate the second And so this sutta is from the mid-length discourses number 19 discerning thoughts into two. And this is exactly what I just uh, explained. <laughs> And so as many suttas take place at anatta pindika's monastery in jetta's grove and the the buddha addressed the monks and says monks badante the monks replied and badante is like saying bante but a bit more because he's the buddha <laughs> the awakened one said this Before my complete awakening monks while I was a bodhi satta the bodhi satta satta is a being bodhi is who is looking for awakening who's that is when he, before he was a buddha that's what a buddha is called before he becomes a buddha a bodhi satta not yet fully awakened i reflected let me meditate discerning and dividing my thoughts into two categories from then on monks i gathered on one side thoughts of outward desires thoughts of anger and thoughts of harm and i gathered on the other side thoughts of contentment thoughts of non-anger and thoughts of harmlessness and harm here i like to also uh replace it by restlessness 
it's that agitated mind. It's, in some ways, it's more relevant to us in our practice. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of desires in my mind, outwards desires, oh, ice cream. Well, maybe not ice cream for the Buddha, but at that time I don't think that really existed. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. There is always some tension that arises when the mind gets distracted towards these things. This is troublesome to others, and this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind, and they lead away from peace. The thing is, when we start wanting one thing, then we want the other thing, and then we want the other thing, and then we want the other thing, and then it starts piling up. And this is what we call bhava, <laughs> becoming. And we don't really notice it, we just get caught up in it, unless we actually hit a wall at some point and we think, oh, this is not very wholesome. <laughs> As soon as I realized this is troublesome, they faded away. And here we see the direct application of discernment and the Four Noble Truths in action. As soon as we realize that these states are unwholesome and they are troublesome to us in the first place, it's much easier to let them go. It's natural because we all want to be happy. We don't want to cultivate tension. As soon as I realized this is troublesome to others, they faded away. As soon as I realized this is troublesome to both, they faded away. As soon as I realized these thoughts impede conscious discernment, they come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. They faded away. So I kept on letting go thoughts of desires as they arose, kept on releasing them, and kept bringing them to an end. And this is, now we make a big, big deal out of these uh, sensual desires, but really, in concrete terms, this is simply thinking about maybe you want to go camping next week or something. And this is a hindrance that arises in you. It doesn't have to be this big selfish thing. It simply is a distraction right now to our meditation. Not that camping is an unwholesome thing, but if we, <laughs> if we really constantly think about it, we, um, we cannot be at peace. We cannot be content. Then, while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose thoughts of anger in my mind, or what I call sometimes impatience. And that's a, impatience is something that we all kind of come up against in our meditation. Impatience is that thing that makes us go after two hours, oh, well, I could just do something now. <laughs> and it sounds um, so it's not necessarily this boiling anger it's simply this oh I could do something else now <laughs> it's that slight impatience so it doesn't have to be big but it's at the root that's what that is dislike then I reflected this is troublesome this is troublesome to others and this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. As soon as I realized this is troublesome, they faded away. This is troublesome to others, they faded away. This is troublesome to both, they faded away. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension and they lead away from peace. They faded away. So 
This is the true beauty of the Four Awakened Understandings, or the Four Noble Truths, is that when we understand that something is troublesome, we move away from it. And this is this process that we're learning to do with unwholesome states. So I kept on letting go thoughts of anger as they arose, kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent and resolute, there arose thoughts of violence in my mind or harm, but this I like to call restlessness, agitation, lots of things just coming up, coming up, coming up. And this is very troublesome. This is, this is the violent mind. It's constantly going. This is troublesome. This is troublesome to others. And this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind. And they lead away from peace. As soon as I realize this, this is troublesome. This is troublesome to others and to both, they faded away. As soon as I realize these thoughts impede conscious discernment, they come with tension and they lead away from peace, they faded away. So I kept on letting go thoughts of restlessness as they arose kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. And these are all of the distractions that we can have. They all boil down in these three, and I talked about it briefly in the orientation. These are the three troublesome things that cause us problems in life. And whenever we have a distraction, it is rooted in that. Whatever one frequently thinks and reflects upon over and over, this becomes the inclination of its mind. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of desires, that person has left the thoughts of contentment or letting go. To cultivate the thought of desire, their mind is bent upon desire. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of anger, that person has left thoughts of non-anger, which is loving kindness for us. To cultivate thoughts of anger, their mind is bent upon anger or impatience. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of harm or restlessness, that person has left thoughts of harmlessness or just calm. To cultivate thoughts of harm, their mind is bent upon harm. Just as in the last month of the monsoon season, this is not a season that we have here, but um, in Asia, they do have this monsoon season, which would be kind of like a winter for us, but it's just a season where it just rains a lot. In the late fall, when the crops are abundant, a cowherd would have to protect his cows. To do so, he would have to poke and push, pull and block his cows in line, this way and that way with a stick. Why? Because he sees that as the leader of these cows, he could be punished, imprisoned, fined, or blamed for letting them graze unconsciously. And see, this is the danger in unwholesome states. In the same way, monks, I saw danger, degradation, and defilement in unwholesome mental states. And in wholesome mental states, I saw freedom, benefit, and natural clarity. So this draws a line very clearly between the difference 
between these two states. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent, and resolute, there arose a thought of contentment in my mind, or just the thought of letting go, calming down. Then I reflected, this is not troublesome. This is not troublesome to anyone else. This is not troublesome to both. These thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment because we're moving away. We're taking, see, when we take a step back, we can see clearly, whether as when we're really engaged into things, we only see that one thing. They bring no tension in the mind and they lead to peace. I reflected, if I were to think and to think and dwell in these thoughts at night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. If I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts during the day, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. If I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts day and night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. Then I reflected, if I were to think and reflect constantly, even if it's wholesome, and see we touched this uh, yesterday a little bit, and now it comes back again, this vitaka vichara. Even when vitaka and vichara, thinking and reflecting are wholesome, or bringing a wholesome object, if we keep thinking all the time, then it becomes burdensome. So the natural inclination of a mind who goes deeper into the jhanas will want to move away and let go of these thoughts. Before long, my body would become exhausted. With an exhausted body, my mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is, fra is far from collected harmony, samadhi. I then calmed my mind and gathered it on itself. I unified it and brought it to peaceful harmony. Why? So that my mind be undistracted. Then while I was meditating, attentive, intent and resolute, there arose a thought of non-anger or loving-kindness. And this is good for all of the Brahma-viharas, compassion, joy, calm. This is not non-anger, <laughs> all of them. Then I reflected, this is not troublesome. This is not troublesome to others, and this is not troublesome to anyone. These thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment. They bring no tension in the mind and they lead to peace. I reflected, if I were to think about and dwell in these thoughts at night or during the day or day and night, I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. I reflected, if I were to think and reflect constantly, before long my body would become exhausted. And with an exhausted body, the mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is far from collected mental harmony. And this is why I tell people to take it easy on the first days, because we come from, most of us, busy environment, work-life situation, and we just come into retreat. I've seen people chugging down coffees to try to keep their mindfulness up. That's not good. <laughs> That's not the way to go. <laughs> you don't need a coffee, you need a nap. <laughs> that is what the Buddha called wrong mindfulness. <laughs> Mitcha sati. <laughs> and so this is exactly what the Buddha is saying here we just 
but in another in another um, a bit further on the path but this is a place where we can see that where he's saying you know when you have a tired body an exhausted body from overworking and here we're only talking about thinking about wholesome states <laughs> but still it is an engagement and it is quite a wonderful image for us to understand what the buddha actually taught and so here we have the importance of actually letting go of these thoughts because it is tiresome to the body and we will discover this uh, throughout our meditation as the mind becomes very clear we will understand how much energy how much mental energy we spend in unwholesome states or engaging the mind into these things and when we let go of these things it's quite amazing to see how much energy there is in the mind not red bull energy but clear bright awareness and that is energy is presence of mind i then calmed my mind and gathered it on itself i unified it and brought it to peaceful harmony why so that my mind be undistracted why because this feels good when the mind is scattered it's not fun when the mind is composed it's blissful then while i was meditating attentive intent and resolute there arose thoughts of harmlessness in my mind or simply calm composure then i reflected this is not troublesome this is not troublesome to others this is not troublesome to anyone these thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment they bring no tension in the mind and they lead to peace i reflected if i were to think and ab to think about and dwell in these thoughts at night or during the day or day and night I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. Then I thought, if I were to think and reflect constantly, before long my body would become exhausted. With an exhausted body, the mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is far from collecting mental harmony. I then calmed it I then calmed my mind and gathered it on itself. I unified it and brought it to peaceful harmony. Why? So that my mind be unscattered. And we saw this in this wonderful simile yesterday. Like the mountain, um, like the rain pouring over the mountain, filling up the cleft and the gullies and the valleys which fill the creek which feel the rivers and the great ocean so this is how slowly gathering these wholesome states we become composed the mind become composed whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over this becomes the inclination of one's mind this is why i tell you don't give up <laughs> keep keep practicing it will it will it will stick <laughs> if a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of contentment or letting go that person has left the thoughts of desires to cultivate thoughts of letting go their mind is bent upon letting go if a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of non-anger, loving-kindness, joy, that person has left thoughts of anger to cultivate thoughts of non-anger. Their mind is bent upon non-anger. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of harmlessness or calm, that person has left agitated thoughts 
to cultivate thoughts of calm. Their mind is bent upon calm. Just as in the last month of the summer season, when all the crops have been harvested in the villages, a cowherd would keep an eye on his cows at the root of a tree or in the open, only needing to be aware, there are the cows. In the same way, monks, I only needed to be aware, there are the wholesome states, because they are blameless. <laughs> Unrelenting, uncurbed was my effort, unconfused presence of mind came to be. My body became calm and free of tension. My mind became collected and harmonious. And see, this is that same sequence that we saw yesterday, but the beginning is a little bit more unpacked. <laughs> and we really have a clear description of all these abandoning unwholesome states and cultivating wholesome ones. And these we have here, the seven supports of awakening lining up together. The, that when he says, my uncurb, my effort was, this is the third support of awakening. First, there was awareness. There was this, this awareness of uh, applied towards discerning these two kinds of thoughts and letting go of the unwholesome, cultivating the wholesome, that is Dhamma Vichaya, the second uh, support of awakening, bringing forth effort, continually doing this, devoted practice, continuous. Unconfused presence of mind came to be. Why? Because there was no more unwholesome states and that is the nature of wholesome states, to be present, to be aware. And joy is not directly mentioned in this sequence, but it does come up. That is the next one. And it actually is embedded in the, the four jhanas that we will see in a, in a moment. And then there's Pasadi, his body became calm and his mind became collected and harmonious and steady. So these are all the seven supports of awakening lining up. Then the first jhana, letting go of all, all outwards desires and letting go of unwholesome mental states, still attended by thinking and imagining with the blissful happiness born of letting go. I understood and abided in the first level of meditation. With the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, my mind became unified. Without thinking nor reflection, with the blissful happiness born of samadhi, collectedness of mind. I understood and abided in the second level of meditation. With the calming of stronger joy, I abided in mental steadiness. Now see, the mind is calming down and the steadiness of mind is even better now than the stronger joy that we were experiencing. Each of these levels they are called also the vimokkas by the Buddha, the liberations, the eight liberations. And each of them is actually better. It feels better. It feels more relieving. And now the stronger joy, which normally we would associate with better, <laughs> now calms down and we get to taste another kind of happiness that is a little different but is very um, very blissful and here present and fully aware experiencing ha happiness within my body or ease the body really calms down at this point 
a state which the awakened ones describe, steadiness, steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. So this is the, the pleasant abiding of the Aryas. I understood and abided in the third level of meditation. Then unattached to pleasant experiences and unstirred by unpleasant ones, as mental excitement or heaviness settled, my mind was balanced, purified by unmoving presence. And at this point, the metta, as we go, the metta continues to follow, continues to, it is the cradle, it is the receptacle, it is the vehicle that brings us there. But as we continually let go of coarser states of mind, as they arise, the metta will become very, very fine. It will become more and more refined and very steady. We don't need to do much. There's, in fact, the less effort we put in, the better. And we start to understand this process that we take a step back. And in fact, we learn to get ourselves out of the way. And at this point, the mental steadiness is very strong and the metta is barely, barely perceptible. But I will be ex explaining the later stages in a couple of discourses into the arupa jhanas that we call the formless, uh, the mental realms. And here, this is the delineation between the two, the Rupa Jhanas and the Arupa Jhanas, the, the Jhanas that still have awareness of the body in them, and the Jhanas that leave awareness of the body and go into the mental realm. And so some of you might already have experienced or uh, might experience it in the next day, uh, that this, as this meditation becomes steadier and steadier and calmer, this bodily awareness will start to fade away. It doesn't completely disappear right away, but as the mind becomes strongly collected, this awareness of body is a bit too complicated. It has too many things and the mind loses interest in it and uh, if something happens we can still notice it but we won't actually be purposefully paying attention to the body it will be only mental collectedness and the later stages this can be experienced as the feeling kind of going up into the head, some people say. And this is what this means here. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined my mind to knowing and recollecting past lives. And now we step into the three knowledges that these are called the Tewijas. And this is how the Buddha, uh, a part of it, uh, awoke. Uh, it is said that he, it is through the understanding of these three knowledges that he was, he had to go through them to understand karma, samsara, and all these things so that he could awake to full Buddhahood. Uh, it's hard to understand karma and how beings reappear through their, with their, 
according to their actions when we don't know our past lives or these things. So here this might leave a bit your own experience, but it's always good to know because it is very, it is quite central to the Buddha's teaching and it's an imp interesting piece of information. I then remembered countless previous lives like this, one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, countless eons of expansion, countless eons of contraction, countless eons of expansion and contractions of the universe. Seeing in that life, this was my name, this was my ancestry, this was my appearance, this was my food, this was how I experienced pleasure and pain, and this is how I grew old. Passing away from there, I appeared elsewhere, in that other place, this was my name, this was my ancestry, this was my appearance, this was my food, this was how I experienced pleasure and pain, this is how I grew old. Passing away from there, I appeared here. In this way, I recalled my countless past lives and their particular context and characteristics. This is the first understanding which I realized in the first part of the night. Blindness was driven out, and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out, and light arose. Just as happens for one who meditates, attentive, intent, and resolute. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined it to knowing the passing away and rebirth of other beings. With the clarity of the cosmic sight, which goes beyond the human state, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, vile and excellent, well-proportioned and disproportioned, happy and miserable. I saw that beings fare on according to their actions. Clearly I saw living beings who were unrighteous in their physical actions, unrighteous in their verbal actions, unrighteous in their mental actions, who were disrespectful to the awakened sages, holding on to unwise opinions and taking actions based upon unwise, uh, unwise opinions. When they separated from their bodies after death, they reappeared in the realms of the fallen, in the realms of misery, the plains of ruin, the plains of destruction. Clearly I saw living beings who were righteous in their physical actions, righteous in their verbal actions, and righteous in their mental actions, who held the awakened sages in esteem, endowed with wise understanding, and took actions based upon wise understanding. When they separated from their bodies after death, they reappeared in realms of bliss, the celestial abodes. With the clarity of the cosmic sight, which goes beyond the human state, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, vile and excellent, well-proportioned and disproportioned, happy and miserable. I saw that beings fare on according to their actions. This is the second understanding which I realized in the middle part of the night. Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose. 
just as happens for one who meditates, attentive, intent, and resolute. And now this third knowledge, the final knowledge, is the one that is very interesting to us right now because it talks about the direct application of the Four Noble Truths here and now and how this leads to awakening, how this leads to liberation. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined my mind to the complete calming of the mental movements or the, the mental distractions. Here this is, I translated this bit, uh, w having uh, the further path in mind because in the last stages of this meditation, we will see that distractions are different. They are not full-fledged distractions. <laughs> we are not getting completely ripped away from awareness, but we learn to see the tiniest bits of mental movements. When the mind starts, in fact, leaving towards the beginning of a thought. And so when awareness is very sharp, we get to catch this at the very root. And this is a good translation for that. But for us also, we can also translate these mental movements as simply distractions. This will, directing our minds to the complete calming of all distractions. This is what is meant here. I understood mental movements as they really are, or distractions as they really are. This is tension. This is the increase of tension. This is the release from tension. And this is how to release the tension. So tension, its origin, release, its end, and then the path. These are the four awakened understandings. I understood distractions as they really are. These are the distractions. This is the increase of the distractions. This is the release from the distractions. This is how to release the distractions. Continually observing and understanding in this way. And see, this is the practice. This is what we keep doing. We, in fact, this whole time we are practicing the Four Noble Truths. My mind was released from the inclination for clinging outwardly, from the inclination to projecting in the future, making all these plans. Sorry. <laughs> no more plans. <laughs> you will see, it's a blessing. <laughs> I think some of you already know. And from the inclination to negligence. This is just lacking awareness in all sorts of ways. In that release, I knew this is release. I directly knew Unwholesome states have been overcome. Lived is the holy life. Done is what should be done. There is no more conceit here. This is the third understanding which I realized on the last part of the night. Blindness was driven out and clear understanding arose. Darkness was driven out and light arose. Just as happens in one who meditates, attentive, intent, and resolute. Monks, just as if there was 
in a remote forest, a vast and extensive marsh on low-lying ground, where would live and forage a great deer colony. Then some men would come intent on their ruin, intent on their harm, intent on capturing them. He would cover up the safe and free path to be traveled on with joy. And he would open a deceptive path, set down a groomed male decoy, and, a, and bring up a domestic female lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to ruin and declined. Then some men would appear, intent on their happiness, intent on their welfare, intent on their liberation. He would clear up and reveal the safe path to be, to be traveled with joy. And he would cover up the deceptive path, release the decoy, and remove the lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to growth, prosperity, and abundance. This story I just told you, monks, is to teach a lesson. Here is the meaning. The vast extensive marsh on low-laying grounds. This is a designation for outwards desires. The great deer colony, this is a designation for all living beings. The man intent on their ruin, harm, and capture, this is a designation for Mara, or death and wickedness. The deceptive path is a designation for the unwise eight-spoked path, that is, unwise understanding, unwise thinking, unwise speech, unwise behavior, unwise living, unwise practice, unwise awareness, and unwise meditation. The male decoy, this is a designation for the happiness of craving. And the lure is a designation for lack of conscious discernment. The men intent on their happiness, welfare, and liberation, this is a designation for the truth finder, truly worthy, perfectly all awakened. The safe and free path to be traveled on with joy, this is a designation for the eight-spoked path. That is wise understanding, wise thinking, wise speech, wise behavior, wise living, wise practice, wise awareness, and wise meditation. Monks, I have reopened the safe and free path to be traveled on with joy. And I have revealed and closed the deceptive path, released the decoy, and removed the lure. Monks, what should be done by a teacher for his students, holding their best interest at heart, out of loving compassion, that I have done for you. There are these roots of trees, monks. There are these empty huts. Meditate, monks. Do not be neglectful, lest you become remorseful when the time has passed. This is my advice to you. This is what the Awakened One said. With an uplifted mind, the monks delighted in the Awakened One's words. And so this is quite a wonderful sutta, which has many parts to it, quite a lot of material to take in on a third day. And truly reveals and goes at the core of the Buddha's teaching, this 
wholesome mental development, sorting through what are unwholesome states and what are wholesome states, their particular qualities, each of them, understanding this with discernment and working away from unwholesome states and towards wholesome ones and never giving up, continually practicing like this. And it will make impressions on the mind, wholesome impressions on the mind. And it will become, it will start to stick. Do you have any questions? Yes. Is it is it something that you intentionally practice, or is it something that just comes about? Like if you're if you're practicing metta, is compassion just going to kind of come about, or is it something that you put intention into? This is something that we cultivate, that we um, that we intentionally. Yes, you you are right. Uh, and it, everybody has a different mental makeup. So some people, uh, some people have different mental inclinations. And some, when it just comes up like this, a lot, some people it's easy and it just comes up. Some people it just doesn't. <laughs> and uh, some people it's both. It's, uh, they can. It works well. Sometimes there's uh, obstacles that come up and that is very, very normal for everybody. And then there is uh, uh, going beyond that and um, breaking through this and it becomes much more uh, integrated. This is all karma. Everything that this mind of ours right now is or is generating is completely conditioned by everything that we've lived in the past and of course in Buddhism this is not just this one life and so some just the fact for, for one thing just the fact that you are all here now listening to the Dhamma and you in committed to a 10-day retreat and there are many different kinds of traditions out there and you accidentally happen to stumble upon this one in particular <laughs> as a hazardous or a, a strange coincidence well, in fact, in Buddhism, that doesn't exist. This actually is from your own karma, from the past. Because you've done a lot of good deeds, you come upon the Dhamma again. And um, at different levels of... Um, of development. And so... There, there are suttas where the Buddha says sometimes you know memory will be sluggish at first, and then people realize, oh yeah, <laughs> this feels familiar. And um, often when um, people, um, sometimes it's just a matter of understanding a few things. Really, just a matter of perspective. Um, I saw. I saw this great image the other day. It was um, you matter, don't give up. 
but it was the sign that was saying that. But the way you could read it was, you don't matter, give up. <laughs> or, you matter, don't give up. And it was really these two very clear, you could see this, and it's all a mental standpoint. It's how you're going to see it. And there, there was no one or the other. They were really kind of really clear. So it's the same thing when we uh, on this path. And this is all bhavana. This is all mental development. So when what we are doing here, that is the way of cultivating these states. There's no other way. When that, if there's anger arising, for example, well, there's no other way that we can cultivate loving kindness than to abandon that anger, to let it go, to calm it down. The Buddha said to bring it to an end and to bring up loving kindness again. And as we continually do that, it is subtle because on retreat it is hard to notice because we're in it. <laughs> and the mind is just completely, you know, we, we have a hard time seeing our own progress because we're completely in it. And we don't see from an outside perspective. This usually happens when we leave the retreat. But when people have a metta coming up easily, for example, that means they've, uh, they've practiced for example, generosity a lot. They've been close to the virtues a lot. Uh, for example, um, uh, their, their mind hasn't accumulated too much heaviness. And uh, the way that I know this is that through personal experience. So <laughs> I can, I can uh, tell you out of direct experience. And so, um, I, I know this because um, I've lived it. So, uh, when that's the greatest teacher, in fact. Uh, not, I do not recommend it to anybody. But uh, <laughs> it is how we learn. It is a lot is about our mistakes. And, but really when... Uh, a really important factor will be that um, there is no remorse in the mind. We've we've held a virtuous life or lifestyle, and uh, we've been generous, not uh, clinging to things. Um, but this being said. This is, in fact, to be honest, this is quite rare. <laughs> that someone would just come in a retreat and just, just go into metta. There's no problem at all. To be honest, I, I haven't really seen that very often. And yeah, it's, it just doesn't really happen. Um, there, there usually will be a few days of, you know... Um, because because this this meditation is not uh, we cannot lie to ourselves we have to be very truthful and that is the true beauty of this teaching uh, we cannot bring uh, rocks along with us uh, in our heart we have to be light and uh, if there's anything in in our heart that we're holding on that we're pushing down in the basement where it, it will come up it is unavoidable because that is also the beauty of metta is when we practice this metta is like buoyant it's like it brings everything up right away and whatever is heavy that we carry it will actually show us 
That's the beauty of it. It will directly point it to us. It's like, oh, here, there you go. Because it's clear. It's You either feel the love or, or you don't. <laughs> so there's no... Um, there is no um, kind of in between here. So it will really show the mind the direction. It's a beautiful guide for the mind, especially at the beginning. It's like, hey, here, this is wholesome. <laughs> and then, and then you will see very clearly because if there's any kind of uh, sadness or whatever it is it contrasts very clearly with it. So it makes it very definite. And that's why a lot of people, they think, oh, wow, what's going on? You know, I have all these things <laughs> coming up. But that's completely natural. It is, that's, that's what's going to happen. And to be honest, pretty much everybody goes through that uh, every retreat. So, long answer. <laughs> Good question. Bhante, yes. I have a question for you. Yes. Nice that you're here, Delson. <laughs> um, it's about the uh, puja this morning. Um, I'm looking at my my written notes because I want to remember. Um, it talks about three kinds of company. Yes. Do you remember? And yes. It says that the highest company, and then the company that you don't really want to be involved with, and then the harmonious company. Yes. What's the difference between the highest and the harmonious? Is it to be solo as opposed to living in a company of people? Or I don't understand the difference. Yes, well, that's a good question. Um, I don't think it's uh, too far off at all. You know, these two, the the highest company, there's the highest company, the dissentious company, and the harmonious company. So what the, the Buddha is explaining there is um, basically, you know, unfortunately we don't really have the context for that. We only have that sutta, right? We only have that discourse. So we can only extrapolate. But I believe that there was probably a situation where you know the there was probably dissension or contention amongst certain members of the sangha some monks because this was a common thing and um you know and it's a sangha it's a community every every almost every night they would gather in the hall and you know meditate with the buddha <laughs> and that's when the buddha was giving some talks and you know um, like the middle length discourses they're fairly long talks, but there's way more talks that are short. So the Buddha didn't always, you know, give a 10-hour talk. He did sometimes, but um, so there might have been that day, you know, some strife or something. And the Buddha is explaining, reminding the monks of, of what... Of what this path is, or what is what would be the right kind of assembly or company, and so he's saying, um, you know, there it, it's not always, you know, in the West we have this very, um, uh, we try to really box things into their places and uh, make like, oh, this is like an actual triangle of ideas, you know, or something like that, but <laughs> the, the Buddha isn't um, he is a bit like that but um, it it doesn't always and that's one of the problems that we encounter today is that we we try to m put everything that he said together and make cement out of it but 
his teaching was very fluid, very flexible. So we can do that. We can couple and uh, put things together like this, but we have to remember that it's open. <laughs> and these are, these are principles and he's teaching them. I don't, we don't know the context of that particular situation. But the highest company is the, high, the, the company where he's basically saying this because he's um, showing that the elder monks should show the path to the newer monks, the Nawabikus. The, the Teras should show, show the right path. Uh, and that's how this Dhamma and discipline will last for a very long time. It's when the elders show the right uh, conduct. And that is the highest uh, company. Because everything that comes after, it, is bound, it, is, it has all the potential to continue being like that. He said they're not, they're not lazy. They're, they live content with very little they put forth energy to realize what is unrealized, to accomplish what was unaccomplished. And so they're, they're constantly striving for the highest, and that's why the high, that is the highest company. Now there's the dissentious company, and then the harmonious company. And so... That is all depending on the context of the situation, we don't know. But there, there is that up, opposition where he's saying, you know, the, these two things. You know, you either choose to be quarrelsome and uh, throw verbal daggers at each other, like Bhikkhu Bodhi translates, or uh, you can, or you can live together in harmony, looking at each other with kindly eyes, blending together like milk and water. And at that time, he says, and he goes even further to explain that, and that's why I chose that in the, the puja, is it explains Dhamma Samadhi again, where um, he says, at that time, when the company is harmonious, like we've seen in this sutta, the, it's not based on unwholesome states, it's based on wholesome ones. And these monks at that time, are practicing mudita, sympathetic joy. And so they're living in a Brahma Vihara, in their way of living. So see, it's not just meditation. The Buddha said, clearly, the way we relate to each other, the way that we live amongst each other, it is possible to live, and he says that, with Brahma, in the Brahma Vihara. Because that's what it means. Brahma Vihara is the abode of, of Brahma, but living like Brahma. And um, and when we do this, there is gladness. There's Pamoja that arises. With Pamoja, there is Piti, joy. With Piti, there is uh, calm, Pasadi. And with calm, there is um, ease, sukha. And then with ease, there is samadhi, collectedness of mind. And so when, and see, this is the mistake we very often do. We think, oh, meditation is only this sitting practice. It's not. In fact, so much of it is the way that we live all the time. Because if we live in the Brahma Vihara, when we sit, we're right there. <laughs> so it's, we don't have to go through all these hindrances. So, because we didn't accumulate them. If we live harmoniously together, there's no hindrance. We just wish for everybody's welfare. There's never an unwholesome state coming up. We basically live in jhana. <laughs> so... Um, this is how I interpret the meaning of this. I hope this answered. Good. <laughs> okay.
Okay, good. Right. Oh, yes. I just wanted to comment on uh, the Sutta and uh, thank you for that lovely talk. Um, it's interesting that there's so many different elements in that particular Sutta. There's uh, the Four Noble Truths, there's the Eightfold Path, there's, but I see the core of it as right intention because the Buddha, as the Bodhisattva, rather, is talking about the three types of thoughts that he had to deal with. And it seems to be a direct reference to right intention, which is to let go of sensual desires, let go of attachment to sensory experiences, and to have non-ill will or loving kindness, as you said, and thoughts of harmlessness, non-harm, non-violence, in other words, compassion. So it seems like this is something that we need to bring into our daily lives as well. Yes, <laughs> I can only uh, agree completely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's share some merits and then I will let you go free. Dukha patta chani dukha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hondu sabbe pipani no Idang no punyang sabbe satta numodantu sabba sampati siddhya aga satta chabumatta deva naga mahindika punyang tanga numoditwa chirang rakanta buddha sasasanang May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sad, sad. Thank you for coming, Dalson. Good surprise. Well, of course, thank you everybody for coming. <laughs> I am not overlooking your presence. Good to see you all and keep smiling. This is quite good. And I will see you tomorrow at the puja. Have a wonderful evening.